So yeah, so first of all, I'll give myself a bit of introduction. My name is Mary Grigleski. <coughs> I'm a yeah, IBM Java developer advocate. Um, so as such, I go to conferences and present uh, topics, and my area right now is to uh, present reactive uh, and, and in Java in that space. So by night, too, I'm a community organizer. I run the Chicago Java Users Group with my other co-organizers, too, and then other meetups, too. So I'm very much into like promoting the community, too, uh, as such. So yeah, so today my topic, um, it's about reactive for the impatient. Um, as such, this is also a very gentle introduction to reactive programming and reactive systems. We have really a survey of four popular reactive Java tools and libraries, namely RxJava, Spring Reactor, Akka, and Eclipse FertX. And a special note is that IBM has a partnership with Lightbend, and Lightbend is the producer, the maker of Akka. Um, the Akka product suite includes like Akka, the core, and also the uh, Lagom microservices framework and also the Play framework for UI. So, so first of all, let's talk about why reactive. So reactive itself is not something all brand new. I mean, as such, it came out, um, and specifically to, let's say, Akka, the model it uses is an actor model that actually came out of Erlang in the 80s, too. Essentially, too, it's reactive is, is very much a way of life for telecommunications uh, for that industry. Everything has to be fast and responsive and in real time. So why is it that lately in the past maybe four or five years, we are hearing a lot the buzzword about reactive? Um, reactive, react, and it's actually quite confusing. And, and also for me, I started um, at IBM eight months ago, so that's when I started also like learning more about reactive. And I found it to be quite confusing because then there, yeah, again, there's all these frameworks. So I like to kind of clarify a bit in here. And actually, may I ask you how many of you already have worked on reactive systems in here? No, no, oh, okay, so a few, like event-driven, essentially, yeah, asynchronous. So just want to get a kind of an understanding, so. Okay, so first of all, there are like evolving changes in the marketplace. So it used to be hardware was like, like simpler, but now, of course, we all know there are multi-CPU, multi-core CPU, there are um, other like hyper-threading, all these uh, hardware is making it kind of more compelling for software to get kind of bas basically get caught up and make, take full advantage of the hardware. And of course, too, there's container, containers, virtualization, all these are making it kind of even more urgent that software needs to get caught up. And of course, uh, ultimately, too, it's really like over here, I put down like the, the impatient human beings, and that's how I pick my topic, because it's really reactive. It's really meant to be for us, the impatient human beings. We want things done to be right away. We want things to be very responsive kind of thing. So, and of course, too, another thing is on the application level, too. I mean, think of now, you know, we all have multiple per person in your family. We have multiple devices. We have maybe multiple cell phones, tablets, and laptops, and everything. So in a household, we have, like, so many devices connecting to the network. That's got to be a better way for software to manage all of these requests going into the systems, too. So, okay, so let's then go into talking about what is reactive. So I want to quickly point out to there's a reactive manifesto. This is a set of guidelines, and it's headed by Lightbend, um, plus some, some, a few other companies too. But essentially, it, it provides a guidelines of, to kind of dictate, or not so much dictate, but it's guidelines to say what constitute like a reactive systems. Um, so over here, I won't go into all the details, but you can visit this link. And then just a summa summary, in summary too, it basically, it came out in the latest version in version 2.0, came out in September of 2014. Oops, a little too soon. And uh, it's basically promising more flexible systems that are highly responsive and very tolerant of failures and in, in how it handles failure too. That's an important aspect of it. So, so when we talk about reactive manifesto, then this, these four, um, principles always would come up like if you look into that. So first and foremost is the responsive. Um, these are yeah, four core principles. So by being responsive, it means that systems need to, like all of the requests needs to be responded to in a very timely manner. Um, doesn't have to be like right away, but at least it, you don't you know, degrade the system in, in terms of response time. Um, very responsive. And then there's also the elastic side of it. Elastic, it means that 
if their systems is under load, it's, then, then it should be able to um, respond to it and maybe moderate the input or maybe like adjust the resources to handle all of the requests. So essentially, it's kind of monitoring so then the throughput of the system won't suffer um, over time. And, and then if there are like less requests coming into the system, then the, the amount of resources should be also lower to, to kind of free up some resources to handle something else. So in other words, it's yeah, very uh, elastic scalability. It handles that aspect of a system. And then another um, important thing is about resiliency. So like not only your systems it being responsive, but in failure conditions, it needs to be responding in a timely manner to handle failure condi con conditions as well. And to be able to recover from system failure um, a lot more um, like on time in, in that responsive manner too. Um, let's see, there's something. So, um, so basically resilience too is basically achieved by like replication Containment, isolation, and delegation too. Um, so, fail, um, and uh, let's see. So, basically, recovery of each component can be delegated to another external component. So, then that will achieve like high availability, um, and then ensure by replication too, if, if anything. So, okay. And then another, the the fourth principle is really the message driven. So, message driven is basically the enabler to enable all three other principles to become reality. Because in a, in a reactive systems, um, all of the components are isolated in time and space and resource and, um, yeah, and, and all of these. So there's, there's got to be a, you know, the way to connect all of these components together. And that's really like been, being like enabled by the message-driven nature of the systems. So let's see. Let me just make sure. <laughs> um, OK. Okay, so some important distinctions, and I'm using a picture of the fruit because we're looking at like their reactive programming, functional reactive programming and reactive systems and architecture, and they can be confusing too, and not only that, then we hear about React um, and React Native. So React and React Native came from Facebook. Mm -hmm. um, they are the JavaScript version, mm -hmm. and they don't, they, they definitely support like the reactive principle, but it's not like a full-blown like reactive systems. Um, they are JavaScript and again by um, uh, Facebook. And React Native is the mobile uh, enablement of it. Um, and then in, on the Java side, we're talking about reactive programming. So by reactive programming, the difference is that between reactive programming and functional reactive programming, even though they kind of look the same because we're using in reactive programming, we're using like the construct in Java, we're using, making use of Java 8 uh, functional programming and streaming and all those, and very highly, like doing it very highly like functional kind of style. But the difference is that in reactive programming, what drives the logic forward is, is, is event-driven, so then the change of the state of the data will actually drive the flow of the system forward. However, for functional reactive programming, that one is when it's like, the flow of the system is, is basically driven by the threat of execution in your program. So there is a difference in there. Um, and then for reactive systems and architecture, that's basically bringing this systems level concept, like one level up. Um, in reactive programming, we're handling like an individual. For example, in microservices, handling an individual component. You're handling one component, the logic and the data manages all the flow. But with reactive systems, we are talking one level up. It's basically you're managing a set of, like your whole ecosystem, managing the whole reactive systems as a whole. Um, and, and that kind of basically um, handling, uh, being enabled by message-driven um, kind of capability and being able to enable all of the components to kind of talk to one another and kind of synchronize all of their processing too. So actually it's interesting too. I, it's just a note too. I was, in uh, India um, just two weeks ago for the Great Indian Developer Summit. And it was interesting, if you have been to India, um, okay, so I was doing the same talk, and then I, if you've been to India, the traffic system, there is no traffic signal in most of the streets, and like no traffic lane, so you basically have to dash across the street, like, you know, among traffic, there are like tuk-tuks, little cars, or um, like buses, and like, you know, vehicles, and all kinds of stuff. Um, and so I was explaining to reactive programming to um, like all the audience there, most of them are new to, to reactive. So I was saying that, well, think of your traffic system. You're, it's in some ways to reactive systems, you're like 
you know, all of these cars and vehicles components are all in individual themselves. But somehow there's a way you're crossing the street and no, nobody got hurt, right? So there's got to be some mechanism that kind of enable all of them to kind of still function in a kind of positive flow. Not to say nobody got hurt, or maybe, maybe you know, very occasionally somebody will get hurt. And actually, interestingly, two of you are, if you know Vancat, who is a very, very well-known speaker, when I spoke to him about it, he said, yeah, except yeah, everything is okay, like if you cross the street like that in a reactive system manner, but then we'll have to do post-mortem occasionally if people got hit. So anyway, I just thought I brought this up. It's like an example of a reactive systems in real life. And of course, there's also back pressure built up too in, a, in, in crossing the street. So, but anyway, it's just some, something I thought I'd bring it up. Okay. So, um, so here a slide is about um, differences between event-driven and message-driven. So in reactive systems, it's very much is event-driven. Um, it's enabled by like message-driven that capability. So what are the differences? So this is a slide, slide I actually took from the Lightman uh, documentation too. So event-driven is basically events are being published and there's no ad specific address being saying, telling like where the message is going to. So it's kind of like a soapbox, you are like having events emitted like locally. So it's up to those who are interest interested in it, the observers. So these, in reactive terms, these are observables. So your events coming out, they're observables, being observed by whoever is interested. So they are the observers that are interested in kind of reacting to it accordingly. So that's that, so no address associated with it. Whereas in message-driven, message-driven actually, communication is like two persons talking. You know where your messages are going to. There's an addressable recipient and also a single purpose. And here too, I'm just replacing it with envelopes. It's like much like soap, right? If you have done WISTO, like web surfaces, it's like soap envelope. There's address like associated with where your messages is going to. So that's the differences. So. Okay, so now I kind of bring up to, because as I'm working through this, I was thinking it would be a good way to kind of think of a, te a use case, how, like where we can kind of employ this technique, like reactive programming. So I was in uh, Tokyo uh, for a Java users group uh, conference. Um, anyway, so I went inside for a ramen shop. And uh, here I won't go into details yet, but I just thought kind of pique your interest because I think there will be a, a good use case to use the reactive programming and I'll explain in a little bit. But first, yeah, let me again talk a bit to about uh, reactive programming and patterns and terminologies, um, just so you know. So reactivity is, is the, the um, reactivity is really the process of responding to external stimuli and propagating events. And events themselves are really the stimuli that, that expect some um, action to happen. And then there are streams. So streams are really primitive representations of a sequence of data elements and observable, uh, I mentioned earlier, they are really stream of events. And the design pattern being used to their observer pattern, composite pattern, and iterator pattern. So. And here, I'll explain a bit more too. Some, these are like some basic illustration of streams. So I'm borrowing this from the Rx model, the reactive extension um, uh, website. There's a website there. And so basically for reactive programming, we're talking about streams programming. So we are representing a stream as a timeline. In the very top one, this is just a stream without any events on it. So it's just probably waiting for something to happen. And the second one here, we see some shapes. They are really, some events are happening. And then often you see a perpendicular. This means that the streams itself has a, has a, has a definitive like time ending to it. So it's basically the streams finish doing its thing and it's terminated. And over here too is another uh, representation. You see like a, a cross here. It signifies a failure event in here. So, that, uh, so in reactive programming is that um, failure events are being treated like first class citizen too. Unlike in Java programming, for example, you, you do exceptions, you need to do try catch and all these exceptions. But in reactive programming, um, failures comes in as a, just another event and that needs to be kind of taken care of yeah, accordingly. So. And then over here, the bottom one, yeah, we have uh, events happening, and here there's no ending. It signifies an open-ended streams that continuously receive like events, so. So here is also an example of doing, uh, putting it into code. So here I'm using a, an operator, um, map. Um, if you've done that, a map is a very commonly used um, 
in RxJava, especially our, uh, the reactive extension. And this does, what it does is it does da some data transformation is the function. So over here we have, I'm, I have an example of a timeline of some events, so that contains data. This, this is a simple case. So there's one, two, and three. Then basically we apply the function here, the map is what it does is it takes the input and multiplies by 10. So if you see that after the transformation, then you should see this timeline will have one, will have 10, two is 20, and three will becomes 30. So we put it into code, then you can see that like we're doing like observable, doing a dot just. So this is like the input to it. Um, there are events with data, one, two, and three. And then you do a dot map, um, and then making use of Java 8 and above the functional style of programming, you can nest all of your commands together and then dot map and you apply your function to it. And then immediately too, then you can also do a dot subscribe. So th this basically the consumer is also being kind of like issue in, in the same statement. So that's one aspect of the beauty of reactive programming because um, you, you don't have to like, you know, in, in traditional imperative style, then you have to do like if this, if that, and do all these things. But in reactive programming, you can basically, or react, yeah, then you can make use of the functional style. It's a lot more, um, concise and elegant too. You can do everything on one kind of statement. So think of it it's kind of like a mini, like server and client kind of interaction. You have server coming in, you process it, and immediately you do a subscribe. The, the client, the consumer, can be all done within one single statement. So, so over here too, then you see the output. The subscribe in here is just simply outputting the value, an item, and then value. So over here will be out, output is 10, and uh, item 10, item 20, and item 30 in here. So, so there are also many other operators too in uh, RxJava, um, for example, like filter too. So you can actually have a stream of, especially there being used um, kind of favorably, I guess in the big data streaming uh, operations, because you can then simply just do some filter um, in here and then and then you eliminate a lot more like, you know, extra code to it too. And of course too, there, there could be some performance um, degradation. It depends on your usage too, but it's not like, you know, all, all like, uh, you know, the, the definitive like golden way of solving problems. But it's just on the coding side, it's much more elegant is what it is, so. And then if you want to look further to the source I took it from is rxmarbles.com. And there are some interactive um, exercise you can do too on that site to kind of get used to some of these operators. So now I'll go move on to talk about reactive systems design. So again, reactive systems is like one level up um, of react reactivity that we're talking about. So these are some of the patterns that that are um, that actually came out of a, a book too. It's called Reactive Systems Design. It's by a light band um, person too. And that's really, I, I have the link towards the end of my slides, but it goes into more details talking about all of the patterns. So essentially too, the patterns can be grouped into like six major um, categories. So we have state management and persistence patterns. There are flow control patterns, message flow patterns, fault tolerance and recovery patterns and replication and resource management. So. Um, but again, I won't have time in this um, talk to kind of go into detail, but you can look that up too, so. Okay, sorry. Okay, oh, sorry, I think I skipped one. Okay, so here, um, I just want to highlight some things too. So for reactive systems design, some terminologies here. We're talking about reactive microservices versus monoliths. Um, here too, I know in this conference, there are a few talks too about app modernization. So um, we're talking about breaking up monoliths. Maybe in Java world is that maybe used to be like one JVM that handles many aspects of the same system. But now we're talking about microservices, you break it down. So make, like, make systems a lot more maintainable, easy, easier too. So there's also this style, if you employ the style of reactive, then it will make it like reactive micro microservices, making use of event-driven and non-blocking operations. Um, that's what it is. And then again, um, in reactive style, we're talking about you isolating the state, space, time, and failure of a system. So making it a lot more easier in terms of individual components update um, that aspect. But of course, too, then you have a lot more coordination that that aspect you need to manage too. So, and then another um, like patterns that we, we kind of common um, in reactive systems is with circuit breakers. So circuit breakers, I'm sure you 
probably most of you all, well, everybody knows too, is just basically you're stopping failures from propagating itself for too long. And so, so if something failure happens, then the system needs to be able to have some ways of breaking this failure and then handle it accordingly without it being kind of like persisting, you know, throughout the life, life cycle of your systems. Mm -hmm. So, and then another um, terminology here we talk about is back pressure. So back pressure is when there are too many, too many requests coming into your system, then the components is under pressure. So for example, like um, in ACA, there's this supervisor capability. So actor, basically it's, it's like it manages each individual components and there's also some primary actor too. So it could be like when back pressure build up, then maybe your main actor will say, okay, you know, it's a handling the scalability um, aspect of a system, then you probably will spin up more resources um, to handle the request, or maybe you moderate the input or somehow slow down the flow. So then your, your component under pressure um, won't be like overloaded, and that's what it is, it's the back pressure um, side of it. So, And then there's also like high availability and eventual consistency. And then I like to just point out the CAP theorem too. So the CAP th theorem is basically saying that there are in any kind of data intensive systems, there are three aspects to it. One is the network partition. And then another thing is the high availability, availability of your data, and also the consistency, data consistency. So the theory is that, the theorem is saying that, well, in any, any given systems, only two things can happen at once. So basically, um, for network partition is a given, because any running systems, the network is always on. So given that, then either high availability aspect or eventual consistency aspect will have to kind of suffer, one of them. So, so when we talk about reactive systems too, it's, it's pretty interesting is that then we're dealing with high availability of systems that meets the res responsiveness of any systems. However, then in that case, if you're being, high, being highly responsive, maybe systems are still being updated. Your data is still not cons in a consistent state. But we believe that it is okay because over time, your update being done to the data will slow down. Then eventually, when you query your data again, that should come out to be consistent. So that's kind of in a nutshell what, what this um, means, like the high availability and eventual consistency kind of implies. So let's see how much time. Okay, so I want to make sure. Okay, so now there's also another um, specifications that comes out of the reactive systems movement. So that's the reactive streams. So right now it's at uh, specification 1.0 and there are working groups that are started by essentially like Lightband and then with Netflix and Pivotal in 2013 and then later joined by Oracle, Twitter, Red Hat and Spray.io. It is a standard for asynchronous stream processing with non-blocking back pressure and it's basically latest release is 2017. So, um, and then actually uh, the four libraries, are, I'm going to talk about the RX Java, the reactive extension supports reactive streams, kind of partially, but the pivotal spring uh, reactor that supports reactive streams fully. Um, and then the other ACA supports it fully as well. So is uh, Vertex. So. so now what about like microservices? So reactive programming is being used within a single microservice and that implements service like internal logic and it manages data flow. Um, however, for reactive systems, um, reactive systems is basically used in between the microservices and they bridge the communications between, uh, between the different components and it bridge it by the underlying message driven capability. So then it, en it, then it enables to support like responsiveness, scalability, and also resiliency of systems. So let's see. So just a quick, quickly point out too. So in um, in uh, ACA or Lightband, they have a uh, for React for microservices. There's a framework that they have. It's basically from Lightband and uh, it's built on the Play framework and the ACA cluster. And it has RPC style programming, and um, it has a message broker API that's implemented in ACA streams and Kafka. And the persistence is based on concepts of domain-driven design, the entities, yeah. And basically it supports like event sourcing and the CQRS, which is command query um, responsibility segregation. So yeah, that, that I won't have time to go through here, but maybe next time I come, we can talk more about these topic too. Okay, so I'll just go back now to the, to the, uh, the noodle shop um, example. Um, so in Japan there, I went in, into that uh, noodle shop 
and realize that it's kind of an oldest style, um, very blocking type of operation. If I was thinking in terms of programming and computing way, because you go in and then you only have one machine and everybody lines up and then the vending machine order your noodles. And then after you order, then you put in money and it doesn't accept credit card too. And then you take your tickets and then with the tickets, you give it to the server, which is their, their noodle shop doesn't have regular tables and chairs. It's like a bar. So you go inside, you just wait for a space to open up a, like a, in the bar area, then you sit down and eat. So think of, it's really a blocking kind of uh, operation because you go in, you can't, you can't do anything else. You just order your noodles and you have to line up and it's a lot of wasted time. So essentially, reactive systems it addresses the problem by giving you back your time. You do things, um, then you kind of basically, you, you submit your request and then you can then kind of be free up and do something else while you're waiting the process to be done. So that gives me an idea. We can kind of do a system on this. Um, so just kind of quickly, I scribble down on the design thinking. So it's like, you know, us, right? Busy programmers or architects or system person. We are busy doing our thing and we don't want to be bothered, but we are hungry, so we place an order. So that becomes, a, you place an order, those are events, they are observables. So they are to be observed by the observers. Those are the servers at the restaurant. So they, take, they, they know that there are orders coming in. However, in that, this particular case is that you can't really cook the noodles yet because there are many people waiting for the seats to be opened up at the bar area. So I have another observables that basically take um, events when there are open seats avail come, become available. So in this case, the observers, meaning the waiters, would then have to wait for two observables to be available. Like, there are seats open, and then you get an order, then at that point, then you know you can then notify, some way of notifying your customer that, hey, you know what, we are about to cook your noodles, so get ready. So in the meantime, us being so busy, we can just say, oh, it's about ready now, so let me finish compiling my program, and then when it's done, I can walk over to the noodle shop and get my order. So then the waiters then can then say, okay, then now I can tell my cook to cook the noodles. So mean, in the meanwhile, we're doing our thing. Then when it is ready, that becomes another observables that notify, uh, okay, noodles are ready. So when you get the notification, um, us, the hungry programmer, will then say, oh, great, you know, it's ready. Now we finished compiling or finished doing whatever we're doing. Then we go to the noodle shop and, and take our noodles. So that's just a very simplistic case, but it's kind of illustrate maybe that's one use case we can kind of employ a, a very reactive style because think of it as a non-blocking. In this case, we'll become a non-blocking um, application. And of course, too, the order entry part too, we can just do a mobile app too. So then it's, it's not, you don't need to no longer wait in line for the vending machine is, is the idea. So, so again, that's just a, an example. So, okay, so I still have some time. Okay, so now I'll go into the last part of my presentation, which is just I'll step through the four frameworks. So first of all is uh, RxJava. So RxJava comes out of Reactive Extension. Uh, Reactive Extension originally was started by Microsoft as for uh, Rx.net. Um, and then Netflix was interested in porting it. Um, so they did, um, basically in 2013, 2014 timeframe, they ported Reactive Extension to, uh, uh, and called it RxJava. And it is very popular, especially on Android. And then the reactive extension actually is, is just a set of libraries and it's also available in JavaScript now. It's RxJS um, and Scala, Clojure, Swift, and all of the other um, um, kind of a lot of language frameworks. And the APIs are pretty similar, like observables. They're flowable now in, in V2, for example, and then has back pressure as well. Um, so 2016 was when they came out of uh, version two. So here is just a simple example. Um, it's not like we do this every day in our production, but just to illustrate. So in a very um, kind of a simple case of Hello World. So look at like, it's, it's a lot more concise too, because you basically have one statement that you make use of flowable, and then you, you do a Hello World, so you take from array, you take the argument, and then immediately then you can do a subscribe. Because the subscribe over here, all it does is do a system out print line and doing a hello and then basically concatenate your argument, the, the uh, yeah, whatever comes in and do a hello world to it. So, so you can see too, it's, it's a lot more um, elegant uh, when you compare with imperative style programming. So. And here is another example, but it's just a quick illustration to how you actually attach a producer uh, to consumer. 
So it's just here um, observable. Um, earlier I showed too, it said you can do a dot just. So that takes in your stream. And then your consumer, you basically, in this case, it's just a simple system out print line to the console. So then you, what you, how you can do it is just do an observable dot subscribe and then you pass in this cons consumer to it. So, so that's, um, that was, that's a quick kind of thing to Rx Java. But now let's go to Spring Reactor. So Spring Reactor is based on Project Reactor from Pivotal. Um, it's very similar API to Rx Java 2. And the reason is that because the two teams working on Spring Reactor and Rx Java 2, they are the same. <laughs> so, and uh, it's headed by David Canock uh, over here. So he contributes to Reactor as well. But Spring Reactor is newer. It came out of Java 8. Um, so then it kind of takes full ad advantage of functional style programming and giving it a more cleaner interface. Um, so yeah, I was just quoting here is that G David Canock um, kind of tweeted about this. It says, uh, he says, use Reactor 3 if you are allowed to use Java 8, 8 or, or higher, and then use Rx Java 2 if you're stuck on Java 6, or if you need your functions to throw check exceptions. Um, and then this, this is just a list of all of the uh, Spring uh, Reactor like setup libraries. Then you use the core for all your core uh, kind of interaction um, yeah, with, with that. And otherwise, too, it also has like test, extra, Netty. It has good integration with Netty, Adapter, Kafka, Rabbit, MQ. And also, like, it has also incubating reactive streams for .NET and JavaScript, too. So here is a quick example, another quick example. But this one is not a hello world, but just to show, to illustrate, too. So in your traditional style of programming, you look at, like, the top one is traditional style using Spring MVC. The bottom one is reactive approach. And that's uh, using uh, Spring Web Reactive Web Flux. So they kind of look similar, but here's the difference. So over here in the top one, we're saying traditional way started. And then basically, we go and do a get all products, get products. So this is a synchronous call. So then what will happen is that you're running your method, get executed, and you get to this point, then it will be blocking this call. Because then it's then waiting for the list of products to come back. So after the list of products come back, then, then you will see the line traditional way completed. So that's a, the, the old traditional synchronous uh, blocking fashion. However, if you use the reactive approach uh, using the web flux, then over here too, what it does is we are basically doing a call to get product stream and returning a flux. So flux is sort of kind of like you, you go to the store and you need something, you, you get, back a, get back a ticket, but you don't get your, what you're needing first. So in this case then, what happened is you're just asking for the list of products, but the products will be kind of being assembled, getting ready for you. So in the meantime, your client will hold on to this flux, it's like your ticket. And then you, so when you execute this method, then you actually see reactive way using flux completed first before you actually get back your list of products. So that's kind of a, a differences in how they work like internally, so. Okay, so here is just a, a quick comparison too between Rx Java and also Spring Reactor. Um, I've already gone through some things, but just want to quickly point out too is that yeah, Rx Java came out of Java 6, so it doesn't have, it doesn't, uh, well mm -hmm. actually, it does have some of the functional style um, kind of construct now in Rx Java 2. But Spring Reactor is the one that takes full advantage of Java 8 um, capability of the functional style, the streaming style. Um, and uh, yeah, so these are, these are kind of, they are similar, but yet there are some of these differences. Um, primarily event-driven, single-threaded, non-blocking by default, so. Okay. And I have these slides available too, yeah, if anybody wants it. Okay, because of time, yeah, I just want to, because so, okay, so now I get to Akka. So Akka comes out of Lightband, and IBM has a partnership with Lightband in, since uh, June 2017. So Akka makes use of the Actum model, it's from Erlang. It's um, basically makes use of the Actum programming model from the 80s. So the Actum programming model, one good thing about it is, is how it handles failure, really, in a very responsive fashion. So. And then it's all event-driven, and it provides a lot of location transparency, and it's very lightweight. And the resiliency recoverability aspect is basically um, very powerful, too, because it's by its supervisor capability. So, so here, is, too, is just a, a, another like, example. Oh, okay. 
So this is just an example then of Hello World um, of, uh, of using Akka. So you see that it's a bit more code. It's because of this required kind of the model that uses the actor model. Um, but just to, for illustration, so over here, there's a main. So what it does is that the Akka, Akka um, main, uh, so it, it starts up. And basically, uh, Akka.main, that main here, starts up. And then it basically takes in your actor class. The main actor class, in this case, is Hello World.class. So it's simple in, to start with. And then let's take a look yeah, then into the hello world. So the hello world will extend your abstract actor. And basically, too, we want to look into the pre-start. This one will get called. So what it does is it's, um, let me just kind of make sure. So main, yeah, so it, it, the, that's the main uh, business logic happens here in the pre-start. Pre and then um, uh, the greeter, then there's another actor, it's actually called a greeter, so another actor to actually handle the actual greeting part too. So this is where it is, um, and, uh, okay, so let me take a look, okay, uh, sorry, oops, I think I'm like a little bit too much, okay, okay, just want to make sure, okay, so just want to point out is the pre-start that basically starts off another act actor, which is the greeter. So then now we can go into the greeter. So greeter becomes kind of just a simple. Well, all it does is that it basically receives, it, it, became, it basically is a receiver. It receives command, it's listening for you know, instruction, and it says, okay, I receive you know, my command. All I'm doing now is that it's basically do a sender.tell and then basically print itself the name of it itself and returns back to your hello world earlier. So, so essentially, that's what it is. So you can see that ACA might involve a bit more coding because of the actor kind of model. But if you build up like really um, sophisticated, like more yeah, sophisticated and, and complicated systems, Zaka is actually uh, pretty powerful too. So, um, okay. And then this is another um, code example. But because Zaka started off um, in Scala, actually, because like Ben was started, one of the founders is Martin Odersky, who's inventor of Scala. So. Actually, Akka started off as Scala, then they later have um, support for Java. So this is just an example then in, in using Ak um, the actor model using a Scala. So you can see too, this one is slightly like less, less code involved than, than Java. So basically, hello Akka in here, and then this has the greeter doing a system.actor off, and then it's just basically do a greet of Akka. So yeah, so that's just an example to show it to you. So. And now, um, yeah, it's just a five minutes. So um, the last one is VertX that I want to quickly talk about. So VertX is the newest uh, frame libraries from among all four. And um, it's very flexible. It's a very polyglot frame framework too. And it's uh, the nice thing, uh, once, um, like powerful, powerful, powerful about it is that it's so polyglot that you can actually mix in. You can have code in Java, then you can also call like Ruby, you can have JavaScript too. It's a very like a multi-supporting kind of environment to it. And the model it uses is called verticals. Uh, not, it's similar to Akka, but it's not called Akka, it's called verticals. So it's event-driven and it runs only when they receive a message. And there's that vertex event bus that handles all of the events. Um, and again, they are not restricti restrictively tied to any container, so you can be used with other libraries as well. And this is a very simple, again, this example to doing a hello world. So again, too, you can just do all the command in one line. So what it does in here is that vertex, you start up the vertex engine, you do a create HTTP server, and basically you do a dot request handler, and then you pass in your request and your response is all chained together. Hello world, and then you do, do also a dot listen and binds this listener to port 8080 in this case. So again, it's, it's also um, very um, elegant, the style of programming. Yeah. Okay, so I think with that, I'm almost like out of time. So just a recap at this point. So uh, some of the things I already talked about, so, but I'll quickly go over. So reactive is an overloaded world in today's market, but not for the faint of heart, but for the determined. So when I, even when I first started doing like de declarative programming reactive, I found it kind of confusing because it's just different. It requires you to think differently. But once you get over the hump, it's actually pretty elegant, this, this style. So I would encourage you, if you haven't already done it or thinking about it, uh, to kind of learn about reactive programming and functional programming. Yeah. Um, so we talk about some of the benefits too, um, and then uh, yeah, this one I already talked about. 
And then uh, the one thing I like to point out is reactivity has really not been fully ready on the database level yet. Because in order for systems to be clean, to be fully reactive, your whole stack needs to be reactive. However, in today's world, the um, relational database, they are still using blocking I.O. So when you get down to that level, then even if you have connectivity, now there's a database connectivity level, there is non-blocking um, libraries now. For example, our DB, DBC, that comes out of Pivotal too, that's, um, that's non-blocking. And there are also other, um, like, um, also like Ben too comes out with um, this, this library called Slick, it's functional programming API for database connectivity, but it's only for Scala. So, but for, for, again, for database engine level, it's still very much a blocking IO at this point, so. Okay, so I think with that, then I'm kind of right on time, right? So, and, um, so thank you, I wanna thank you again for coming to my talk, and this is how we can stay in touch if you wanna be um, on Twitter. Uh, if you follow me, I'll follow you back, and then my GitHub, uh, my profile on IBM, uh, the developer.ibm.com. And then I'd like to also invite you to sign up for an account um, on, on the IBM cloud too. That's um, all free, there's no, no strings attached and, it's, uh, and uh, there's no time limit on the free tier too, so you can use it forever. Um, and this is the link to, uh, to look at more um, resources about IBM on reactive systems. We're still trying to build up too. Right now we have a, a strong relationship like with uh, partnership with ACA, with Lightband, so we're gonna be putting in more resources to it. And plus I'll be running a virtual reactive user group um, too, if you are interested. Um, the intent is to have everybody comes together, maybe sometimes we'll have an uh, interview of some specialists in reactive programming systems and, and also maybe workshop or have participants also like maybe have a round table discussion, that type of stuff. So I invite you to uh, look for that if you're interested. Um, and then these are the links for the other resources about the IBM Alliance for Lightband with Lightband, Reactive Manifesto and the Reactive de Design Patterns. That's a good book. You can go into reading up on a lot of the patterns too, so. We have and time for a, okay. a couple questions. Any questions? So uh, of the two frameworks, uh, RxJava and Spring Reactor, does one have more market share or seem more robust or would you recommend one over the other? Or? Yeah, I, that I'm not exactly sure the, the metrics, like what is more stronger market share, but I know Rx, for example, Rx is very popular among like mobile, mobile uh, de uh, developers because yeah. yeah, it came out first and it's easier to use. You just kind of basically include the library and then you can do things with it. Now, however, for Spring Reactor, I, I believe if, let's say you're already enterprise places, they already have Spring Framework installed, I believe the Reactor will be kind of an easier transition too because it's Spring, it's all within the Spring Framework. So yeah, okay. So I have a question. Uh, I think it was a slide 26 you were showing uh, a REST controller and there was a get mapping for a collection and then uh, you changed it to be reactive and it was returning a flux. Oh, yes. So how does that work at the HTTP communication level? Let's say the client is, say, a web front end um, and then the JavaScript front end will get the data gradually and, and uh, is it using HTTP events? Oh yeah, I, I, that's a very good question. Yeah, why don't I take it offline and, and talk okay. about someone with you? That's that's a very good question. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah. okay. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, because it would t take more time for me to explain to and all, and all that. Yeah. Okay. And yeah. Okay. Any and other it, questions? Yeah. Okay, let's thank Mary. Thank you. Just a very quick thing is if I'd like to invite you to also check out callforcode.org. This one is an initiative of IBM, it's for a hackathon until like, it's open until July 29th too. So you can join as individual or teams of up to five people. There's prize money is for like uh, prevention, natural disaster, like preparedness. Yeah, so just want to invite all of you to, to sign up. So thank you. Thank you.